Well, hello and welcome to Photography with Emery, and that of course would be me, and I am here on location at the Glenmore Reservoir in Calgary to do a viewer request on infrared photography. So, why don't we get started? Hey, the sun shines. Cool. It's the first time in Calgary for a while. Awesome. Big boat. Before getting into taking infrared photos, let's quickly examine the electromagnetic spectrum to see where infrared lies. Without getting very technical, there are three major flavors of infrared, near, mid-wavelength, and long wavelength. The one we're concerned with is the near-infrared range, which starts from about 700 nanometers and ends around 1000 to about 1200 nanometers, depending on your source. As you can tell on this diagram, 700 nanometers is basically the deepest red color that we human beings can see, and longer wavelengths than that are invisible to us. To our digital cameras, that near-infrared range is just barely visible, even though there is an infrared blocking filter that sits right in front of the sensor. An easy way to demonstrate that a digital camera can see into this range is to simply take a remote control, point it towards the lens, and hit a few buttons on it. There you have it. The infrared light glows for the camera, even though we humans cannot see it. Now I'd like to clarify that taking photos in this near-infrared range does not mean we are taking photos that represent heat. In order to perform thermal imaging, specialized equipment is required which can see the long wavelength infrared range that sits between about 8 to 14 or 15 micrometers. In other words, when taking photos in the near-infrared range, we capture light that reflects off of surfaces such as sunlight off of trees and buildings. But when we take thermal photos, we are seeing the heat energy that an object is giving off or radiating, not reflected light. For a more complete explanation on this topic, check out my blog. Okay, so we know that our cameras can just barely see into this range, but how can we take those real infrared photos? Well, there are actually quite a few things you can do, starting with purchasing a camera that has its infrared blocking filter removed. If you like voiding the warranty on stuff you buy and potentially damaging your equipment beyond repair, then you can follow some instructions found on some websites that guide you through how to remove the IR blocking filter. Or lastly, probably the easiest and safest method, which I'll be using, is to use an infrared filter. In my case, I'll be using this Hoya R72 infrared filter. You'll notice that it's quite strange in appearance as it looks almost completely black, really it's a really deep red. The reason it's so dark is because the filter absorbs almost all visible light and only allows the near-infrared wavelengths through. I have a link on my blog that points to a PDF file on Hoya's website that shows a lovely graph of what frequencies of light are permitted through. Now, the Hoya R72 is a very popular filter for doing infrared photography as it's reasonably priced and works well with most unmodified digital cameras. But there are many choices out there and I recommend you do some research as well. Some links I've added to my blog point to other filters you can consider, so feel free to check it out. Alright, so I'm going to run through uh, just a quick tutorial on how I would basically take pictures with this very black uh, looking filter here. And of course that's an Hoya R72 that I'm using. Now what I've done is, because this filter is really dark, your camera is going to have some serious issues metering as well as focusing. So one of the things that you start with is that you basically just set your camera up without the filter on it frame up your shot, and I'm kind of have just a, a wide angle shot here of the landscape. And I've got a fair bit of the sky. The sky is almost absolutely perfect for, for this, these types of shots. We get the white puffy clouds and we're gonna have hopefully a very black looking uh, sky. And you might see some of the vegetation as well. And that vegetation should turn out fairly white. And uh, so that's one of the things you do, frame up, Manually focus, uh, since again, focus, yeah, it probably won't work. Uh, with this on there, you can try it, but I really doubt it. And um, focus up the shot. You're gonna be probably shooting in manual mode as well. So you're just gonna kind of have to take a few test shots. That's, that's what I found have worked fairly well. And after doing some research as well, that's basically what most people do, is they'll just 
try, you know, F4 for an aperture, and then they'll set their shutter speed to, oh, somewhere around maybe a second to start with, two seconds, and then uh, sensitivity. I'm going to keep my sensitivity kind of low. Uh, I'll try 200, maybe 400, and we'll see what the outcome uh, ends up being. And of course, on my blog, I'll write step by step what I've done as well, uh, since, hey, I'm going unscripted here. So I just came out here uh, without the script, as you can tell. It doesn't work as smoothly as when you're reading a sheet of paper. But hey, nonetheless, let's give it a shot and see what the, uh, the outcome is. So what you're looking at right now is the image straight from the camera with no alteration. Since the IR filter blocks essentially all visible light and only allows very deep reds and near infrared frequencies through, the image not surprisingly has a red tone. But usually IR images are converted to black and white, which I've done here using Photoshop, and the result is more pleasing to the eye. In addition, I also stopped at a couple of places along the pathway to take a few shots. You can see me panning around here so you can get a feel for the location. Next, here's a regular unaltered color photo of the scene. Now the unedited IR version. And lastly, the converted black and white image. Here's another place I stopped as I found that tree quite interesting. Again, every time I took photos with the IR filter, I used one, two, and four second exposures. Taking multiple shots allows for more choice when picking that one photo you want to edit further. In the next part to this video, I'll demonstrate how I converted these photos. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode and you found it interesting. Definitely a very different type of photography uh, with infrared stuff. So I do hope that you, you know, have a chance to try it out. And as usual, check out my blog because I will have a supplemental post on it. And this is, of course, just part one. Part two will feature how you post-process a lot of those images because that kind of takes a special touch, so to speak, because obviously right now you're just going to get these very odd cough colors images but that's the nature of it but anyway so stay tuned for part two coming up soon and of course facebook and twitter links are off of my blog and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already thank you and see you for part two take care Okay, this was fun. This is where I started and I'm I'm parked somewhere up there. And uh, yeah, I gotta make my way up this pathway all the way there. Oh well. No pain, no gain. Mm, this is very good. Oh, why are you filming me? Don't, don't film me. I'm, I'm busy. I'm pollinating. Mm, this is very good pollen, but you're really annoying me. I'm warning you. I'm, I'm just, just had enough. Uh, but oh, that's it. You don't get it, do you? Take this. Go run. Ah.